ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start the program, and I'm going to start by stealing from Marvin Klima, one of our guests. Um, I had made the comment that the outside is full and the inside is not so full, and Marvin says it's the outsiders today who are the important people. So all of you on the outside are the important people. Um, welcome to the Jewish Policy Center National Security Roundtable. We have a number of people here with us for the first time, so let me introduce the JPC very, very briefly. We were established in <clears throat> 1985. We were a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we provide perspectives and analysis of foreign and domestic policy um, by leading scholars, academics, and commentators, three of whom we have today. We are very, very happy to have this particular panel. The Jewish Policy Center is a voice in the Jewish community and in the Washington Policy One community for a strong American defense capability and the budget to pay for it, for close U.S.-Israel security cooperation, and specifically for advances in missile defense and nuclear modernization. Um, on the domestic side, which is frankly our smaller side, we advocate for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, energy security, free speech, and intellectual diversity. I know that sounds like our bigger side. Um, we share our work through In Focus magazine, copies of which, uh, if you don't have the, the winter issue already, there are copies available here, and the spring issue, which is devoted to Israel, will be out in a couple of weeks. We also have our Insight articles and a blog. I am pleased to introduce our speakers today. Um, first, Dan Gray, who is a vice president with the Lexington Institute. He is an analyst of U.S. national security policy, the future of conflict and warfare, the information revolution, counterproliferation, and defense industrial management. Um, but today he is going to talk about leadership, American leadership, and more specifically, the perils of the absence of American leadership. Our second speaker, I'm going to go through the introductions first, then the speakers, and then the questions. Our second speaker will be Dakota Wood, who is a senior research official uh, fellow at uh, the Heritage Foundation. In his official bio, it says that his focus is on programs, capabilities, operational concepts, and strategies of DOD and the services. Um, but today, he is going to talk to us about paying for those things and how we marshal the resources to ensure that we have uh, not only the quality and the types of uh, military equipment that we need, but how we fund those things so that we can indeed protect ourselves uh, our assets and our allies. And our third speaker will be Paul Joyle, who is the Vice President of Public Safety and Homeland Security for National Strategies, Inc. Um, a security analyst and media commentator, you have probably seen Paul on one of the network shows or on CNN or Crossfire or PBS. Paul's area of expertise is the politics and national security matters of Russia and the countries of the former Soviet Union. And Paul is actually going to talk about his subject which is uh, security and cybersecurity as regards Russia. So I would ask Dan to join us up here and hang on to your questions. We'll do three sets of comments, and then we'll do your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shoshana. It's great to be here. Um, I'm actually going to talk about American global leadership and the anthropic principle as applied to the international order. So I'm going to actually give you three, 30 seconds or a minute of physics before we get to politics. How often do you get that in these kind of organizations? What's the anthropic principle? Well, it's basically an idea that says that the world is the way it is, and we are in the world to observe it the way it is because if the world weren't compatible to our existence, right, we all, we all wouldn't be here. So all the things we say, we say, isn't remarkable. There's just enough nitrogen in the atmosphere, but not too much. The spin of the electrons is just exactly right to allow for uh, the kind of buildup of minerals and actually for life to sustain itself and all these kind of things. It's sort of how is it with all the possibilities of the way things could turn out in this universe, it turned out in a way absolutely compatible to our way of life, right? So... In a sense, what we're seeing is a world, if you will, we were meant to see. It was meant for us. Uh, it, and if it was or any different, at, at the very least, we wouldn't be here to notice the difference, right? Now, there's an extension of the theory. 
which says that really in the universe it isn't, there's one way. So it's not the whole universe is this way, electrons working the way they do here and physics being what it is here, but there are kind of islands of it. And in other places in the universe, there's islands where different laws of physics apply. Gravity is different, right? Uh, Higgs bosons do different kinds of things. And in there may be life in those uh, other bubbles, but they wouldn't be anything like us, and we wouldn't survive in them. <laughs> now, so let me, the reason I bring that up is because I want to talk about a variation of the anthropic principle that we can apply to the, in, to the nature of the current international system and America's role in it. So I actually am going to talk about leadership. I'm just coming around back in. All right. America for probably almost two centuries now has had a view that the best international system was one that was an echo of, conducive to, reflected the fundamental principles and values that we held. You know, put it another way, a world of free nations, of, of republics, where people could vote, where they could, uh, uh, you know, earn the fruits of their labor and hold on to them and all the rest, was good not just, it was good for them, but it was also extremely good for the United States. And you can go back and think about Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, we can talk about uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson, 19 you know, principles, uh, 19 points rather, that kind of thing. Now the person who sort of made the, the, the greatest difference in this and carried this forward was specifically Roosevelt who not just recognized that there was this congruity between the way the world should operate and the values that should be held internationally and those that were important to us, but that it needed to be something that was built. Right? He had, was looking at an existing international order that had produced global depression, a second world war, and while he was thinking about some of this, was in the midst of genocide, firebombing of cities, and ultimately leading to the creation and use of the first nuclear weapons. So for the U.S., the engagement in the world as part of the relationship with Britain, as part of getting into World War II, was predicated on the fact that the world had to be different. It had to be essentially reformed in basic terms that were very similar to our values and, and the way we, we wanted to live our own lives. And I will point to you to just one document to start off with, which is the Atlantic Charter signed uh, uh, when uh, Roosevelt and uh, Churchill first meet. It's sort of not a, it's not really ever kind of put out quite formally. It's, it's, there's a handwritten version that I've actually seen a copy of uh, where Churchill makes some wry remark about sort of, you know, getting taken to the cleaners and all this. But what are the principles that the Atlantic Charter? From the Atlantic Charter, we go to the UN. You go to a whole series of, of essentially the rules and, and uh, structures that now make the modern international system. But all of these come from fundamental American documents. You want to check on the Constitution, Bill of Rights, uh, Lincoln's Second Inaugural, on and on and on. No territorial gains are going to be sought by the powers. Territorial adjustments must be with uh, the wish, in accord with the wishes of the people. All people have the right to self-determination. Trade barriers lowered. Global economic cooperation and advancement of social welfare. The participants, this is in the, in, in the charter, would work for a world free of want and fear. Remember the four freedoms? There's two of them right there, right? And the participants would work for freedom of the sea, so the global commons and that kind of thing. And from that, you know, you sort of can, can walk your way through the principles that were enforced for the UN, for the creation of the post-war economic institutions, uh, for the way we actually even treated arms control, uh, for the kind of trade agreements we are currently dealing with and have dealt with over the last year, whether it's NAFTA or Pacific or whatever, WTO, WTO and all the rest, all right? So, in effect, slightly differently than the anthropic principle, we created the bubble, we the United States and so the Western allies, in which we could best live. And the fact that others who participated in that same value structure would live better too was sort of a, sort of a given. But that was sort of the nature of it. The problem is that system is under stress. It could go the way of a soap bubble. As Ann Applebaum observed in the New York Times just last week, quote, right now we are two or three bad elections away from the end of NATO, the end of the European Union, and maybe the end of the liberal world order as we know it. That's what's going on here. And this is without consideration, given what she's talking about, 
are the actions by those who don't share those values. I mean, she's just focusing on sort of, it's an, in, it's an internal, if you will, problem, not the, the external. Now, the reason I bring that up is there's sort of this, this vision. Uh, you can read um, uh, the, the Better Angels of Our Nature, which sort of talks about, look at how the trends to uh, more uh, rule of law is working better and uh, the end, you know, we're sort of no longer killing each other in the same mass numbers. Or you take President Obama's argument about ISIS, right? I mean, it's on the wrong side of history. There is a belief, right, that this system isn't just built and maintained. It sort of exists like atoms do in our, in our, in our system. It's, it's laws of physics. And therefore, we really don't have to worry about all this stuff because it'll all work out the proper way, right? If the Chinese end up being the dominant power, whatever world system they come up with, whatever set of agreements they come up with, will somehow be con conducive to these same principles because they're laws of nature somehow. It's not something you actually have to work at and ensure and enshrine, which of course is quite ridiculous. Um, so the question I think that often has to be dealt with by those of us sort of trying to push for a strong America, a free world, and all the rest, is why should this country lead? It is a fundamental question being argued uh, or being fought over in, in the politics uh, of the presidential campaign. Right? Let them do it themselves. Right? They're rich, they're, they're whatever. Right? So there are political, legal, economic, and even moral reasons for U.S. leadership. But the basic case, I would argue for you, is that we built this system for ourselves. <coughs> now, it's a good thing that others, in fact, almost everybody, if they kind of apply themselves right, can benefit from it. But this is a system that suits our interests best. And any, I will argue, any system one can imagine, certainly any one designed and built by any of the other potential world leaders would be much less conducive to world stability but certainly to sort of peace and prosperity for, for Americans. Right. Uh, the National Intelligence Council observed that without U.S. leadership, this is, I think, something they, this is a quote from last year or a year before, without U.S. leadership, quote, the risks of interstate conflict are increasing owing to changes in the international system. The underpinnings of the post-Cold War equilibrium are beginning to shift. During the next 20, 15 to 20 years, the U.S., will be grappling with the degree to which it can continue to play the role of systemic guardian and guarantor. The more important thing is we are the only guardian and guarantor, and it is of a system that not only do we build, but that fundamentally is congruent with our interests. There's no reason to believe that a system constructed by and for non-democratic states will be compatible with U.S. interests or even the survival of the United States. More to the point, in such a system, it's not clear that we can survive, at least politically, as a nation or as a people. An international system designed to fit the beliefs and politics of Vladimir Putin could well look like a global version of the movie The Godfather, if you, if you, if you like that kind of environment. That constructed to suit the Chinese leaders might resemble the book, the movie, 1984. In effect, as the system changes, it is not that the United States can withdraw and make itself uh, you know, whole and free and secure and continue its liberty. In responding to how the others behave, particularly as they behave in non-democratic uh, ways, in non-capitalist ways, in predatory ways, and one has to begin to respond. And depending on the degree of the response, one can pretty well, at times, end up looking like that very thing one is fighting, <coughs> rather than being the nation that we have been for the last several hundred years. Or we can choose to leave the, uh, the uh, uh, stage completely. I doubt we'll do that. So, you know, we talk about strategic leadership. It is a combination of capability, <coughs> intentions, values, and visions. Uh, while there are some nations that share, in fact, a fair number now, that share many of our values, most of them are politically, psychologically, economically incapable of taking up the mantle of strategic leadership. Others have the means, but their values are antithetical to ours. 
that is, they would change that environment. It would be a different anthropic environment and one in which, again, we might not survive. Uh, still, others seek to claim a leadership role based solely on a single attribute of national power, economics, or military, which doesn't work that way. So when one surveys the present international environment, assuming that one is generally happy with that and thinks that that's a good thing, not just for the United States, but for others as well, as long as they play by the rules, three facts are clear. And I said this in my original paper. Europe will not lead, China cannot lead, and Russia must not lead. That leaves only the United States. Um, as one of the leading experts on U.S. national security concluded some 20 years ago, the United States must play the role of what he called the reluctant sheriff or risk squandering the gains of nearly a century of effort to create and sustain a stable and secure international order. Without the current values that the system is built on, without the U.S. as global leader to push those principles and protect them, I don't see any way that there can be a stable and secure international order. It will be something else, potentially something, if you want to go back far enough, pre-Westphalian. Let me end there. Thank you for having me here today. I'm uh, pleased to be a participant in the Parade of Beards, uh, although I'm wearing my scalp with pride as opposed to hiding it under masses of hair, so uh, should be a confidence thing. Um, so it was a great, great talk by Dan about the role of America and the importance of America in the world. Uh, diplomacy obviously is great. Uh, information, the transfer of culture and values is great. <coughs> Uh, economic levers uh, are great, and what we have found is that all of them are underpinned uh, by military power. So you can talk a great game, but if you don't have the ability to back that up in some way, nobody takes you seriously on the world stage, right? I mean, Switzerland is Switzerland. It's not the United States, right? Um, so when we get to uh, talking about uh, military power, uh, there's always these questions about how much does one need, uh, how much uh, does one need to spend uh, to have it, and what do you intend to do with it, right? So those circumstances are always unique when they come together based on where you're at geographically on the planet, who you're going up against, what your uh, wartime <coughs> objectives are, uh, what type of peace you might want to uh, pursue out after that, uh, the conflict occurs, the deterrent value of a particular posture of a force. I mean, all there's so many variables. <clears throat> so when we try to assess the what and how much and why and where, uh, we really tried to uh, take some lessons from history. What does history have to tell us? We don't have to invent this right now. You know, the nature of man's pretty consistent over time. Uh, the contest for resources and access to places and the imposition of ideologies are fairly consistent over time as well. And uh, when we looked at back over the past uh, century or so, and Dan was a great part of this effort, <clears throat> we found an eerie consistency in the size of U.S. military forces that the country needs and wants uh, which means that regardless of decade, competitor, economic status of the country, there is this consistency across time. And uh, so that led us to a particular sizing uh, of the active components of the military, and I'm happy to entertain questions um, about that. But <clears throat> when we get into talking about how to pay for it and how much is needed, uh, you can eyes glaze over with numbers. So I thought what I would do is just throw out some reference points uh, so we know uh, what has been the norm in the past, and then when we talk about what we're at today, <clears throat> hopefully that contrast is, is illuminated. Uh, so again, just as, as points of reference, uh, if we look at averages uh, during the Cold War, that whole big long period of time that we stood uh, really there at the threshold opposing the Soviet Union, if you looked at it as a percentage of GDP, we were spending about 7% uh, on, of GDP on the, the military. It was roughly a quarter of the federal budget. Uh, and if you put that in today's dollars, 7% uh, of uh, GDP of, what, $19 trillion economy, something like that, you're actually talking about a baseline budget for defense of $1.3 trillion. Okay, that, 
that was the average uh, through the Cold War. Okay, it's mind-boggling now, so you have to ask yourself the question, why the huge disparity and why is that so surprising? And I'm happy to discuss that here in a bit. Uh, if you get a bit more recent, and let's say we go over the last 40 years, the last two decades of the Cold War, 70s and 80s, happy decade of the 90s where there are no uh, threats, and then 9-11, uh, post-9-11, that 40-year average still comes out to about 4.5% of GDP, uh, about a fifth or 21 percent of the federal budget dedicated to defense, uh, roughly 774 or 775 billion dollars per year on spending. Some people talk about 5 percent of GDP. We're in an 18, 19 trillion dollar economy. You're still talking 900 billion dollars, right? So these are big dollar figures. So where are we at today? Well, today, uh, by law, uh, baseline budget is capped at 525 billion. So 525 relative to a Cold War average of 1.3, 40 year average of 775. Now, so these numbers are important when we try to assess where we're at and whether you're in a bathtub or not and need to climb out of that, right? So current averages right now for this current year, it's about 15 and a half percent, almost 16 percent of the federal budget uh, goes to defense uh, projected for next year, FY17, will be down at about 14 and a half percent. In terms of GDP, it's somewhere around 3, 3.2 or thereabouts, so well under historical averages. Do you need to spend a trillion dollars on defense? Well, you know, that's arguable, likely not. It doesn't need to keep walk step pace, but the size of the economy can be viewed as a surrogate measure of the position that America has in the world, the economic activity, global interests, access to markets, how other countries view the U.S. in terms of purchasing goods and services. So it really is a surrogate measure of, of where America's at, you know, its size and its heft and the, the influence that it has on the global stage. Arguably then, you probably need a military force that can at least cover down on your interests. So if you were just a regional power and you were only interested in the Americas, coastal defense, maybe some special forces, um, overhead surveillance for the Western Hemisphere, not a big deal. But if you're also interested in Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Central Asia, the Asia Pacific region, all these other areas, in those areas you have challengers or competitors that are eaches, right? Russia and Europe, China and Asia Pacific, Iran in the Middle East, Boko Haram and others, you know, in, in, in Africa, drug cartels in South America. So in their individualness, uh, what we currently have could easily handle them individually or singularly. But if you're going to be a global power, your totality has to account for the aggregate challenge presented by those disparate array of challengers or threats. So it's not just us balancing against Russia and Europe. We have to account for balancing against Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, China, any other competitor that might be in the world in that totality. So when we think about what we're spending now, uh, roughly $608 billion when you go with baseline budget, and then the additional funding not subject to uh, legal restrictions at the moment is called Overseas Contingency Operations Account, or OCO funding. Uh, that's the money we're using to drop bombs and spin gas and replace uh, systems when they fail uh, as a consequence of current operations, right? And so all that total, right around $600 billion. In the past, we were easily shouldering a burden of $775, $900, over a trillion. So again, Cold War reference point, we're not in a Cold War. We don't have a globalized monolithic threat. But when you take the aggregate measure of each of our competitors and you add them up, it still calls upon the United States to be able to uh, present global capabilities. So we looked at the funding of where we're currently at, far, far below what historical averages have been and the, what the country has been able uh, to, uh, to spend money on and the relative importance of its defensive capabilities relative to the other things that the federal government spends on. But what is the current status of the military? Well, just a few years ago, the Army had 45 brigade combat teams. That was to sustain operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Arguably not the, uh, the most uh, uh, lethal foe when you think about capabilities that a conventional opponent would have with 
aircraft and missiles and submarines and ships, right? These are dismounted uh, irregular infantry. And yet the Army needed 45 brigades to maintain a sufficient rotational base, put people into theater, bring them back out, and do those kinds of things. Uh, currently, the Army has 31 brigades. So just in the space of about three years or so, we've dropped from 45 down to 31. The money is available for readiness for those units. The Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army have testified that only about a third of existing Army Brigade combat teams are at acceptable levels of readiness. So we had 45 not too long ago. We only have 31. A third of those are actually being assessed as ready. So you've got 10 brigades that you could immediately throw into a fight. It would take some while to bring the others to, up to speed. Within the Air Force, about 80 percent of, uh, of the uh, United States uh, Air Force's tactical aircraft uh, have consumed about that much of their life. Okay, so if you looked at the, at the total number of airplanes, tactical fighters in attack, they've consumed about 80 percent of their usable lifespan. Usually it's measured in flight hours. So I build a plane, I can fly it for about 6,000, 8,000 hours depending on the design. Once I've gone that length, you know, metal fatigue, chafing on wiring harnesses and those kinds of things, I put it out in the boneyard and I need to replace it. So our current Air Force is about 80 percent used up. Uh, the Navy historically has needed about 350 ships, roughly. Every uh, major study from the bottom-up review in 1992, all the quadrennial defense review reports, the independent national defense panels, uh, and then just historical usage that we looked at as well, all agree the Navy needs about 350 ships. Currently, the Navy has 271, 272, depending on what month we're in. They would need $20 billion a year in shipbuilding funding to get up to their desired objective, which is 308. That's still below 345 or 350. 20 billion a year. Historically, they're funded at 16 billion. And so they're not going to get to their desired Navy uh, size, uh, which is far short of the size that they actually need. For the Marine Corps, for a few decades, they had 27 battalions. Currently, the Marine Corps is down to 23. Uh, if funding stays at uh, the low levels that it's currently at, there's danger of them dropping to 21. Battalions, comment on the Marine Corps has said that at 21, uh, the United States Marine Corps is basically a one war force. One war force. So once you've committed it, that's it. <clears throat> so Navy, small. Air Force, uh, number of platforms, pretty good, but aging rapidly, old and uh, being becoming obsolescent in many ways. Uh, the Army, uh, dramatically small, two-thirds of the Army, approaching half of the Army that we actually need, uh, and then the Marine Corps uh, having difficulties maintaining its size as well and the ability to transfer combat power from uh, sea to, uh, to shore. So that's kind of where we're at. Now, when we look at the forecast around the world, what are the challenges? We've seen Russia and Ukraine, Crimea. Russia's now involved in Syria. You all know the mayhem that's currently uh, in, uh, unfolding there in Syria, you know, the status of Iraq. Uh, Iran just had a set of missile shots, you know, in clear violation uh, to include their weapon sales of all agreements that are supposed to be countering that. North Korea is... Um, uh, on its way to becoming a more substantial nuclear power, uh, and it's very provocative, very aggressive. We've seen China actually building islands in the South China Sea, uh, militarizing them, uh, very aggressive in developing blue water navy capabilities, a very uh, modern, robust uh, submarine force, and uh, cruise missile capabilities that extended to reach out hundreds of miles, right? Uh, then we've got drug cartels in the Americas and uh, problems in Africa as well. So the world doesn't seem to be getting any nicer. Uh, I didn't know if you were going to mention General Hayden's great little comment where uh, I was on a panel with him a couple of months ago, and he said in that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, you see Jimmy Stewart's character wishing he'd never been born, <clears throat> and then you see the town and what it was like without Jimmy Stewart's character involved in it, right? Uh, of course, at the end of the movie, Jimmy gets to come back and everything is right with the world. What we're currently <coughs> seeing is what the world is like without American leadership and without America being able to defend not only its interests, but the interests of uh, friends and allies that kind of keep stable the world order that Dan already talked about. Unfortunately, unlike the movie, we can't reset uh, like Jimmy was able to do uh, in, in that particular movie. So it's going to be a long climb up. And when we currently look at these funding profiles, uh, the, uh, we're not very optimistic about that. So I guess to conclude my comments, it's really about, you know, when we talk about how do we fund this, 
the solution to defense funding problems are not found in defense. If you're talking a federal budget of $4 trillion, and something like 72% of that is on uh, non-discretionary entitlement kinds of things, Medicare, Social Security, paying interest on the national debt, all the things that are involved, defense is the easy target to squeeze out. <clears throat> and so really it has to do with what is the role of the federal government in seeing to the needs of the country. Defense should be one of those, but it get involved, gets involved in many, many other things. And so it's a lack of prioritization within the national discussion and the allocation of national resources such that we're seeing defense becoming a lower and lower and lower priority, <clears throat> shrinking, aging, less ready force, less able to meet the national security challenges of the 21st century. So I guess that's my overview of the current defense posture, and uh, glad you all had lunch already. <laughs> Shoshana, thank you very much for the kind invitation and the opportunity to contribute to your quarterly. Um, I'd like to thank the previous speakers, Dan, for putting, putting the large perspective on how ideas have consequences and the situation we're in. Dakota, um, the uh, handcuffs that we have on our uh, military forces. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on why, uh, picking up what Dan said, why Russia should not lead. And I'm going to look, uh, I'm going to particularly focus on their um, development of a very large and effective information warfare capability. And when I use the term information warfare, I'm using it in Russian terms, which is an, an, the entire gamut of, of influence operations, almost like um, uh, what active measures was in the old days. So we're looking at all the types of steps that go from white propaganda all the way through black propaganda, disinformation, maskarovka, et cetera, all the way through cyber, unconventional warfare, and uh, all these efforts. But let's look at the, um, since we're talking about uh, military capabilities, I'm going to focus on that. So in my article on cyber threats and Russian information warfare, I explained how Russia has developed a formidable information warfare capability that highlights its asymmetrical strengths seeking to neutralize the American military advantage. And when you look at uh, Russian strategic military thinking in the, in the early 90s, they, they obviously came, were, were having trouble coming to grasp with their new position in the world and the superiority of the American warfighting capabilities, especially in the net-centric uh, area. They attempted to uh, make uh, steps forward in net-centric net warfare, but in 2008, when they fought the Georgian War, uh, they realized the inadequacy of that. And as we would always say, no comms, no bombs. So they took a, an approach that if we can disrupt the communications among uh, military units, we can deny them the advantages they have for pinpoint accuracy and for, for prosecuting a war. So today, Russia actively seeks out areas of relative strength to compensate for its military overall weakness. And this is why information and electronic warfare is the centerpiece of today's Russian strategic military strategy. Admiral Mike Rogers from Cyber Command stated recently that although China has been behind a major chunk of cyber attacks on the United States, he is confident that Russia has even more enhanced capabilities in this arena. The only reason that Russia has not entered this new form of warfare is because it has chosen not to at this time. James Clapper, Director of National Intelligence, acknowledged last year that a Russian cyber threat is more severe than initially thought. Rano Pontius, who is the deputy to the U.S. Army Cyber Command's commanding general, stated in this past October, on one hand, we can feel very positive of our pace of progress that we're making, but when you put that in context of what the threat is and the pace of change of the threat <clears throat> and the significance of the threat, you can't but come to the conclusion that we're not making progress at the pace that the threat demands, and that will be my point today. Pontius has also described a recognition within the military 
that cyber must be dealt with at the highest echelons of command, saying that cyber issues are no longer just a chief information officer's issues, but, in op but for operational commanders, it must become a responsibility of theirs to, to protect their own network, data, and systems. In my article, I concluded that we need to elevate our cyber command to a full combatant command structure in order to meet these challenges. The U.S. Uh, Army's Europe um, Lieutenant General uh, Ben Hodges has previously described the quality and sophistication of Russian electronic warfare as eye-watering. Russia maintains the ability to destroy command and control networks by jamming radio communications, radars, GPS signals to deny our net-centric advantages. Russia also has a large EW, electronic warfare units, used for ground electronic attack, commu uh, jamming communications, radar, command and control nets. These are being deployed in Ukraine and Syria now to jam drones and block battlefield communications. As Hodges stated, we have great signals intelligence and we can listen all day long, but we can't shut them down one-tenth to the degree that they can shut us down. We are very unprotected from their attacks on our networks. Now, the size of Russian and Chinese capabilities is significant and growing, and we can't even approach this scale. They have companies, they have battalions, they have brigades that are dedicated to the electronic warfare mission. Russia's cyber warfare doctrine is designed to be a force multiplier for their traditional military actions, including WMD attacks. Russia recognizes that informationization, as they call it, these topics greatly influence the modes and methods of the conduct of war. For example, virtual simulations influence what strategy a Russian commander might take. In 1995, General Vladimir Shlipchenko stated that the Russian General Staff Academy was no longer doing force-on-force -force simulations. They were rather doing system-on-system -system simulations to include cyber and other information-related systems. Now, this suggests that cyber issues influence strategic planning from its earliest stages in Russia. Now, what are the Russian capabilities? The Russian cyber weapons arsenal, in the order of threat, are as follows. First, large, advanced DDoS and espionage capability. Now, this was tested, as I pointed out in the article, both in Estonia, in which they used uh, criminal networks, to engage in DDoS attacks against the e-government system of Estonia, as well as the media outlets. They, they used also uh, this type of capability, um, the Nashi, who were given scripts by, by criminal elements like the Russian Business Network to attack the Georgian government. The second area of threat is electromagnetic pulse weapons. They are developing now mobile systems that are put on tank um, uh, tracks that can be moved around the, um, uh, the battlefield in order to create this type of uh, um, uh, weapons capability. Uh, it's also comprised of counterfeit computer software, advanced dynamic exploitation capability, wireless data communication jammers, cyber logic bombs, computer viruses and worms, cyber data collection exploits computers and networks. They do this as particular reconnaissance tools, and then embedded Trojan time bombs. Now, it's interesting to know that when the Russian illegals were expelled from the United States during the, the Chapman uh, uh, affair period, that one of those uh, illegals was interestingly placed at Microsoft 
and it's an indication. So the question becomes, you know, what other locations are, have they um, uh, placed individuals? And we also know that um, one of the amazing qualities of Russians abroad is their tremendous loyalty to the fatherland. And the question then becomes, um, uh, what, uh, what type of force could that be used uh, in terms of a uh, conflict? Now, the Russian military cyber forces number around 10,000. No one has an exact example of that. But Russia is often overlooked as a significant player in the global software industry. Russia produces 200,000 scientific and technological graduates each, each year. Now, this is roughly the same size as India, which has five times the population. And, and it's hard to believe that uh, their software industry can be traced back to the 50s, but it can. These are very capable people. I remember my, one of my first meetings in Moscow at an institute in 1990, and I'm sitting with an astrophysicist, and he had an acabus on his uh, desk. And I said, you know, that's interesting. You, there's got to be a story behind that. Was that in your family? Uh, what's the history on that? He says, well, that's the Russian computer. And he starts doing high-order mathematical calculations on this acabus. I mean, that was an education for me, I'll tell you that. But a study of the World Bank stated that more than one million people are involved in cyber uh, or software research and development now in Russia. And that Russia has the potential to become one of the largest IT markets, obviously, in Europe, even though that's contracting. So the Russia hacker attack, again, on, on Estonia in 2007 really rang the alarm bell. Nations around the world can no longer ignore the advanced threat of Russia's cyber warfare capabilities and, what, what, and the threat that they pose to every country in the world, especially the United States. We're seeing it on display in the Ukraine. We saw it on the display in, uh, in Georgia, and uh, we know uh, because of an announcement that uh, the Department of Homeland Security made that, that um, many of our utility companies were found to possess uh, strains of uh, black energy malware program uh, throughout the uh, system. So it's a, it's a, uh, this is a pregnant threat for us. So from this information, we can only conclude that Russia has advanced capabilities and the intent and type uh, technological capabilities necessary to carry out a cyber attack anywhere in the world at any time. We are not where we need to be, and every day we lose more ground. So when I was listening to Dan's very provocative talk, I, I remembered from my philosophy days the, uh, the American pragmatist uh, Charles Sanders Pierce. And he said that there are certain things which, there are certain truths that are arrived at not through argumentation in syllogistic form, but they represent a brute fact that have to be acknowledged as truth in and of itself. Unfortunately, I think the brute fact here is that Russia has built a capability that can challenge some of the advantages that we have held for many years, and it's a, it's a serious threat. Thank you very much. I don't know why we're applauding, because those are three of the most depressing pieces that I think the Jewish Policy Center has ever put forward to people, but important ones. And so I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and start the question. It's the same question to Dan and Dakota, because you raised two sides of what I think of as the same question. How can we talk about leadership, Dan, if when we decide to exercise it, if we do, we're not sure that we have the capabilities to go forward and do something physical on the ground that will work out for us. And Dakota, how do we talk about changing the levels of spending and changing what we buy if we don't have a sense of leadership that says we need this because we have to be uh, leaders in the world because, as Paul rightly points out, we don't want the Russians doing it and we don't want the Chinese doing it. And we surely don't want people like Islamic State doing it. So how do you get a handle on the chicken and egg problem between leadership and the resources to build your military? And is it the job of a political candidate, perhaps? Um, let's be clear that we're talking about the difference between leadership as a uh, 
process over time, uh, rather than leading in a particular event. So I would argue that um, clearly, to some extent, you need to have the muscle to back up the, the thread, or uh, the, the, there needs to be uh, capability to give your actions, your policies, uh, credibility. But it doesn't have to be necessarily all in place at, at one time. And in fact, to a certain extent, one can use this, these or to change capability, to increase it, to redeploy it, as a way of uh, working with, uh, with credibility, as a, as, a, as a signaling device, if you will. Um, the reason I bring it up this way is, I think it isn't quite a chicken or egg. I mean, the way you framed it, yeah, at, at a tactical level it is. Right? If I'm going to go do something, if I'm going to lead a campaign to somewhere, pick the war and ISIS, I have to have the means. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the real interesting question is uh, whether we acknowledge and uh, accept that role. Uh, and that role may then require a given level of military capability. It may mean that we have to be the, the leader. We have to have boots on the ground. But it's kind of it's it's it's, it's car, car I'm not sure that's that's necessarily true. It's going to always true. Um, but I think that I would argue, and, and even to sort of do a little bit of that. Uh, there are two ways of doing the problem. You either sort of do it the bottom up. You know, if you want this much force, it costs this much to build and maintain it, and then you've got to do it this way. I would argue the problem goes the other way around, right? Which is leadership requires the following uh, attributes, the following stance. That in turn, to go to the next point, uh, you know, you sort of have to have the military capability to, to back that up. Talk about so what are standards in that sense, uh, and then frankly, I would argue, given his historical numbers, the least interesting question on the lot is paying for, because in fact, at four four and a half percent of GDP, this is nothing. I mean, it, it is ironic, it is shocking. By the way, we're not dealing with nobody's mentioned the European problem, but you know, not being able to spend two percent. This is not because these people don't have money. Greeks can do it. I think the Germans and the French ought to do it. It is because they simply choose not to. So it's leadership, the capability, I would argue, to uh, pay the, the check to pay for it. That's the direction that we have to be, we have to accept that. And I, don't, I, don't, I don't know any other way of doing it that will be able to sort of carry this forward. And my comments really, what he said, <laughs> uh, really extends from that. It's, it's uh, for trying to free up the resources for defense. Um, it really starts with, with, with political, uh, you know, the polity, right, the leadership level, but then down to the American public. Uh, political recognition that a need, a compelling need exists, and an acceptance of that, of that reality, that, that recognized reality, right? So. If I don't want to go there, then I just redefine the problem so it's not a problem, right? So China is not a growing hegemonic competitor in Asia. It's just a peacefully rising economic power that seeks to find its place in the world order and become a great trading partner. You know, if we just redefine it, not a problem. I don't have to plan against it. I certainly don't have to apply resources <coughs> to it, right? So, so there's a political recognition acceptance, and that has to either comport with the governing philosophy or the objectives, the principles of whoever's in power, or there has to be a willingness to change that governing uh, set of principles or objectives uh, so that it comports with reality, right? So the current administration, it, it's just completely unwilling to accept that there are problems in the Middle East, as an example, that you might have to apply resources against. So you can negotiate this, you can use diplomacy, you can have cups of tea in Paris, whatever that might be. So if it's not in your political framework, your philosophy, then, then you won't go down that path. And the reason that's important is leadership then, domestically within the country, or if you're looking out the borders, has to present a compelling argument 
And the American public has shown a long history of saying, Roger that, and agreeing to it once the argument is made. And, and are amazingly steadfast in sticking with something. You know, the casualties of World War II, 10 years of war in Vietnam, we've been at this, you know, global war and terrorism thing now for 14. I mean, you know, a, a long-standing willingness to endure or to, uh, to support things if they think it's important enough being handled semi-confidently and you're actually making progress. Uh, and I think that there is, there are consequences to a rhetoric reality gap, which really gets to your point, that, that if the United States starts drawing red lines, whether it's specifically a Syria thing or some kind of an ultimatum against Russia with Ukraine or the Chinese and South China Sea or what have you, if you're saying things and you're not backing that up with meaningful action, then people quickly start to become very skeptical and your credibility and your influence rapidly erodes and it actually becomes harmful uh, because people will then start to exploit it or power alignments, uh, realignments occur where you know, if I'm Malaysia or Italy or Poland or the Baltics, I gotta pick who I'm gonna be friends with because the United States isn't gonna be there in any meaningful way. So that kind of argument needs to be made both on the campaign trail the current office holder and certainly members of Congress to convince the public that priorities need to be shuffled so that we free up the available resources and are not spending it on crop subsidies and you're spending it on other things that actually have a more profound impact on the ability of America to be able to do that. Um, Sarah, and then, then we'll go around to Sarah. Um, yes, but my question is for Dan and also Paul, all of you actually. <laughs> um, I have a feeling, um, and I've often um, believed, that um, if we do not teach civics to our students growing up, they develop the kind of building um that is so prevalent in the American college um, campus um, that there really isn't anything worth fighting for. There's no sense whatsoever that America is exceptional, the only thing they think that we're exceptional in is in exporting our sins and destroying native cultures and um, rounding up Indians and putting them on reservations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering if, I, I really think that um, any kind of military readiness presupposes a kind of education that there is something really special about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, etc. And I, I don't think American students are getting that anymore. I can, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you quoted my brother-in-law Steve Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, I think that's quite emblematic of the, the kind of thinking in our better universities. Sarah, we need a question. Okay, so um, correct me there. And the other thing is, um, um, Paul, you spoke about 200,000 graduates in Russia who are equipped to handle um, cyber um, issues. How many do we have in the United States? Well, uh, these are graduates who not be equipped on cyber necessarily, but scientific, scientific. And, and computer skills. Yes. Okay. How many do we have in the United States? Well, let me put it this way. We have two... Right. Uh, we have a deficit of 200,000 in the cyber area. We, that's, that's our deficit. And we're, we have to go elsewhere to get those. Outside of the United States. Yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. We want to make the argument that, that it's not even a matter of leadership, right? I mean, if you, if you don't understand why, not even who you are, but why you should lead, but what you're leading towards, then, uh, then in fact, most of the rest of this just sort of fall, falls apart, uh, or, or or you get to it, you get to it too late. Um, I don't know whether it's an educational thing. I just don't have a sense of whether it's educational, or it is really part of uh, the current kind of political system we have, where you know, people who, who do know better, who are literate who have read the documents, or at least have read writings on them, uh, have simply chosen for a variety of reasons to ignore these as being uh, 
foundational. And, and, and I don't mean just foundational for us. I mean, you know, they'll say the right things in many cases. But, um, you know, in terms of human rights and dignity and freedom for all and all the rest. But then it's sort of like, okay, but, but put that together with a, a, a role in the world, a leadership role. If you and I, do you remember there was, in fact, for a short time in the uh, Obama administration, that this notion in the UN about the responsibility of the a fascinating notion. It wasn't, frankly, the Republicans who said, bah, you know, what a, what a silly idea. I don't see that in the Constitution anywhere. And uh, uh, it was, in fact, the administration itself who decided it didn't like its own its own rhetoric. But frankly, I think that there is a connection between the kind of documents I was talking about and this notion of the responsibility to protect it. It's amazing that uh, the administration sort of just decided it was more pain than it was worth to uh, to advocate at least for that. I understand. Uh, question for Dakota. Um, it's been reported that Secretary of Defense Carter is spending a lot of time engaging Silicon Valley to get technology leaders out there to, to work with the military and, and cultivate those relationships. I, I'm wondering what kind of value do you assign to that effort in light of the overall picture that you've conveyed about the state of our defense budget, the present force structure, things of that nature? Is, is that Does his efforts to engage the folks in Silicon Valley for the next generation of technology, is that still relevant if we can't if we're not fixing the basics of what we need on the military. Yeah, there are a few drivers that kind of coalesce and that kind of converge on this effort. Uh, one is you've heard of the third offset strategy. It's something that the Secretary of Work has been, has been pushing. So the idea is, is if you're a numerical disadvantage, can you leverage technology in a way to offset that numerical disadvantage? So if you're going up against the Soviets in Europe, you just can't match man for man. Hey, nuclear weapons are pretty cool, you know, because you can offset it. Um, uh, later on, you can uh, harness computers and network communications and precision-guided weapons, this network center warfare, uh, precision-guided munitions regime, and a second offset to so more things in more places with, uh, with greater uh, accuracy and precision uh, since you didn't have as many platforms as you needed. So today, given the state of affairs of the numbers, uh, this thought is we've got all these great technologies that are out there unmanned systems, robotics, cybernetics, information processing, big data analysis, you know. So there's something to that. They're just not quite sure what that is. The second big piece then is this, uh, this mystical label of innovation, right? Creativity. And if you just kind of envision it, it springs forward and, and uh, makes our forces much more capable than they currently are. So who's being innovative? Well, it's the commercial sector, you know. You got disposable phones. You got you know computers in your home. You got Roombas that you know vacuum up your carpets for you. And so there's all this stuff out there. And so the idea is, let's go to the sector that is being the most creative, the most innovative, and see if there's something we can leverage. Either our processes inside the Defense Department, or ideas, or management techniques, or whatever that is. And now the reality that, that bumps up against is being a good steward of public funding, accountability. You know, parts supply base, I and mean, then how do you introduce something into the service at a large enough number that it has some kind of military relevance on a battlefield? You know, um, I mean, I can introduce a new system every other month. At the end of the year, I've got six, eight, ten new systems. How do I maintain them? What's the accountability? How do they all plug together? You know, so there are some realities that, that make that kind of of, uh, of outreach uh, problematic in the practical application sense. But I understand the rationale for it. Uh, you can get some good thoughts in there. Unspoken now is, is another problem with that, that if you bring private entities, we have lots of cash, and lots of independence, you know, look at anything associated with Google or Apple, right? Secret compounds and all that stuff. And you're bringing them inside the building and revealing to them all the problems you currently have and what you might want to do, are you sharing insight into national security capabilities and objectives with a group that may not be kindred spirit in using that for the national good? Does that make yeah. sense? It's not like Apple sharing it with us. Whatever, you know. Um, if I could add to that. Yeah. Like I, know. I, was at, um, I was at the RSA convention last week at which uh, Ashkar spoke. 
So there's another component. It's not just technology. He's going after. He's going after human capital. Right? I mean, we have a deficit. We don't have enough of the highly skilled technical people to fill the jobs in the government, as well as outside the government. By the way. So he's got, and the U.S. government, and, and look, at everyone's fighting for the hearts and minds of these very talented people. And we're, we're going up against a very strong headwind that was unleashed by the traitor Snowden. This is a man who stole 1.7 million documents, and he's trying to make us all believe that he did it for the national good. 1.7 million, okay? A fraction of which dealt with privacy concerns. But there is, there is, that's a very strong headwind. We're seeing it play out with Apple. We're seeing Comey came as well. So um, we need people from that community to come into government. Um, the FBI, of course, has stood up a huge uh, um, cyber division. They're in need of people. And the entire government is trying to figure out how we can create a new way of having technical people work for the government. Namely this, come into the government, we're going to teach you all the good stuff. Then we're going to allow you to go back to the private sector and make some real money. And then come back to the government at some time and give us a little more of your expertise. This is against every system that we have, for the most part, in our national security structure. And so the, these are some of the other components that, that challenge us. Just to sort of dovetail to what you just uh, mentioned and some of the comments that Sarah had earlier, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we seem to lack is uh, the ability to convince people to join our defense apparatus. At one point in our history, we had a thing called national conscription. Is there a case for national conscription now to bring these people in willingly? There will always be a core of those who say, I'll join, thank you. And there's a much larger segment that says, look, I have no interest in doing that, unless you require me to do it. In which case, your scenario of come work for the government learn what you need to learn, go back to the private sector, and then maybe come back to government somewhere down the road, might be achievable. In addition to that, if I'm not mistaken, the current budget for the Defense Department, uh, fully, uh, almost half of it is taken up in personnel costs. You could, in fact, then reduce those personnel costs pretty significantly uh, by going back to policies that might be adjusted or similar to the way they were uh, when we had a draft previously. Is any of this viable? Uh, so I'm a career Marine. <laughs> um, I think something like 64% of the Marine Corps' budget is manpower. Uh, is it maybe it's almost two thirds almost. Uh, when you're trying to compete with the marketplace for talent, right? Uh, it's hard to bring in an 18, 19, 20, 22-year-old uh, and have them you know, living in a squad bay on a bunk and uh, you know, eating lousy food, and maybe deployed from home. So quality of life issues, medical care, family housing, uh, apartment style living, even for your junior enlisted, uh, you know, making it more attractive and, and less onerous, uh, you know, an experience uh, to be in the military. I mean, your paying benefits just have to increase. It's just, it's a fact of life to, to get your recruiting because you're competing with these other industries you can be over the road trucker, you know, making $60,000, $70,000 a year. So how do I convince a kid to come in for 40000 and get yelled at all the time, right? Uh, so there is a manpower competition element to that. Now, I'm a, again, I'm a very practical guy because you know, I've worked with it in the actual real world. Um, I understand the argument for, uh, for some kind of mandatory service, you know, connects the public with this idea of civic responsibility, duty, obligation giving something back. Uh, Starship Troopers is a great book that gets into that. You know, you don't be a citizen or you don't get the rights of a citizen unless you serve in some way. On the military side, what do I do with this kid for two years? It, it's going to take me six months just to get him through basic training. And then I'm going to send him to a unit to do what for the next 12 or 15 before I have to start out processing, right? So 
there, there are uh, warfare has gotten to the point where it's fairly sophisticated, both in the systems that we're using, communications, weapons, tactics, deployment, rotational patterns, these kinds of things, right? Um, and then when somebody comes into a unit, that that unit's going to go on um, a one, like a, a two rotation system, let's say in a three year uh, period of time. If I've only got the young recruit for two years, how do I even incorporate them into a deploying base, right? Um, and if I look at the size of the population pyramid, how many 18, 19, 20 year olds do we have in the country? How many of those would reasonably be inducted into some kind of service? Uh, I've got care and feeding, health issues, I've got to build them someplace, dramatic expansion of, you know, barracks, all the logistical support that goes on with that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and then to what militarily relevant productive end uh, do I want this person uh, for? He's got to be doing something. Uh, and then, you know, again, within that 24-month 24, 24 period, I'm saying goodbye and I have to start the process all over again with somebody else. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that that <clears throat> the types of, uh, of recruits that I'm, I'm talking about is not an 18 or 21 year old. It's someone that understands polymorphic um, malware, you know. And I'm not going to find um, I'm not going to find uh, an 18 um, to 20 year old. Uh, I mean, occasionally you might, but um, the skill set again, I think, is the driver here. Um, what I think that we should look at from a national standpoint, something that I've been trying to uh, promote for years, is a reserve cyber force in the United States. Now, one of the organizations that I was active in for uh, many years, uh, six years on the National Board of Directors of FBI, I forgot, and, and that's a public-private partnership uh, that seeks to protect critical infrastructure. Uh, with uh, 50,000 vetted members. Um, I think that we need to have reserve capability, people who are in our uh, private sector who also come in for a period of time, almost like a National Guard, and get some orientation with the types of systems, the complex systems that we're running in the military and intelligence fields. Um, now Estonia has created precisely that. They have a uh, a cyber reserve capability, and I think that there's many lessons for us to learn. I have a question for you three that I'm almost afraid to ask. And the question is this. Are the people inside the building as optimistic about our ability to protect our national security as you three are? <laughs> well, I've been doing some pretty active linkages, uh, very pessimistic. Um, I, mean, I, I appreciate the humor. Um, it, uh, this is the problem when military officers, senior officials come before Congress and provide testimony is that they are bounded or constrained by whatever the policy is that's been handed down, right? So if the policy decision is, this is your basket of money, then the Army, Air Force, and Navy guy is going to say, oh, I can re-wicker things to make the best use of this basket. But it's not my purview, it's not in my, in my lane to tell Congress this basket is way too small, our boss is crazy, and I actually need double this amount. And they, they just don't have that latitude, right? So um, they, they resize things. Instead, we have a, like a two-war capable force. It'll be a one-plus or a one-four-two-one, you know, a big thing, four little things, a deterrent value here, and cost paint. So maybe they, they use artful language, very artfully, uh, to put the best face on a bad situation. What we have seen in, in, in current Senate and House testimony is uh, a bit more realism in terms of the actual status of the military forces. And just this week, you've had leaks on unfunded requirements lists and those kinds of things, you know. Um, I was supposed to ask for 12, I actually need 17, of whatever that thing is. Uh, so it, it's uh, inside the building, uh, it's a pretty dismaying set of conversations that occur on a regular basis. Nothing to add. I would actually observe that when you hear, we have in the last couple of years, the kind of testimony uh, new chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, named Russia as the major adversary, 
you had the head of Air Combat Command just the other week saying, I ain't got enough drones. I, I can't cover what I'm required to do, and it's only going to get worse. The list is actually going on and on. That what you have is, um, if, you, if you get that kind of hints, right, it's sort of like you're getting the first little whiffs of smoke, but what's going on inside the buildings are raging for us. What about the co cops? Demand will always exceed capacity. I mean, they want as much as they can possibly get. So the COCOMs are a good data point, but I don't think it's... Yeah, be a little careful. Yeah, they, they're going to ask for as many special ops teams, as many drone orbits, you know, as many submarines uh, as they can, because they want to reduce their risk to the bare minimum, right? So the demand signal will always exceed what the available capacity. But where they are, if you go look at General Breedlove, General Hodges, who was mentioned, uh, they've also talked about the problem. It isn't just, I want more stuff. They've also talked about the threat they've been facing. I mean, Hodges had the greatest line of all, which was, I have 30,000 people I'm supposed to make look like 300,000. I, mean, yeah, I don't want to dismiss What an in-your-face statement to the administration if you want to sort of accept it that way. Yeah. I mean, they're very particularly in challenge. Yeah. We have come very close to the end of our available time. So I'm going to take our, you have to be short. Okay, I'm going to try to squeeze in three questions, one, two, and three, but they've got to be really short. Go, Mark. You mentioned that the next issue is the voting closure. Yes. I, since I don't know what's in it, I'm going to raise an issue of Israeli security. It's very important to the Israeli industry. For years, the Israeli industry would have a wish list. Taiwan, I, I, all, all of us would fight to get on that list. It doesn't exist anymore. Only Iron Dome, Arrow, and David Sling. There is a falling, the Israeli industries are falling from doing business in the United States. We don't have Rabbi Inouye and Rabbi Stevens anymore, <laughs> who were our fathers. What can be done to increase getting business for the Israeli industries to support American programs? And there are many examples of where there was joint development that says, both company, countries money. So you just, I, I think it's a political uh, problem, and it's a, um, a willingness to let that door be open, okay? Because if I entertain you sending me a list, then I'm obligated to entertain the context to grow that list to begin with. So if I don't want to have problems in the Middle East, if I don't want to wade into your messiness over there, and you know what I'm saying, and you know, Lebanon and Hezbollah, and all this stuff, if I don't want to do that, then I'm going to subtly tell you behind the scenes, don't send me your list. So I think it has to be an administration of Washington that is willing to entertain the need for the United States to be more involved in that region, right? And then that opens up all kinds of uh, opportunities, you know, business, technology exchange, uh, presence, collaboration, experiment. We're not talking about economic security. No, 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 I agree. It's a part of the same thing. Uh, this is a perception, you could correct me if I'm wrong. The question is, to what extent in the last 20 years plus has the tendency to have senior officers get advanced degrees, masters, and so on, in the course of their training, uh, made them more academic, political in their thinking, less military, and has that reflected in the fact that we don't talk about winning wars anymore, we talk about conflict management, conflict resolution, and this strings out conflicts, making them in the end more expensive and less public support. Yeah. Dr. Wood, would you like to ask me that question? <laughs> I think we are similar minds in this remark. It's a problem, because it does triple down, right? If the administration's top priorities are stopping global warming and rising seas and alternative energy sources, excuse me, alternative energy sources and all these sorts of things, right? Um, then it pushes out, there's only study hours in the day, right? It pushes out thought of combat, killing your enemy, winning a war, as opposed to kind of trickling along. Uh, war is the last option you ever want to revert to. Uh, how do we prevent wars? You know, for a long time, right, the Navy's top documents would say the Navy was there to prevent wars from ever happening to begin with. Okay, let's just presume that that doesn't work. How do you plan to sink the enemy's fleet, right? So it's a risk aversion. Everybody wants to be the master strategist. They all want to be pro-consuls, you know, uh, build, uh, digging wells, 
educating uh, the children of foreign countries, improving their economic systems. I mean, that's what we've seen in the last 14 years, right? So the idea of, of closing with and destroying an enemy, right, by fire and maneuver, um, is just not uh, appreciated or talked much about. Now, you do have exceptions, Ms. Master, uh, Dunford, uh, Mattis. Um, you know, there are some senior officers who really are warrior scholars. I mean, they study their profession. But, but the, the, the culture that this is war fighting, I think, has dramatically eroded in the last 20 years. I can guarantee you that the Russian military institutes and academies do not suffer from that problem. <laughs> and let me tell you, when you look at what they were thinking about in 1992, they were already starting to, to um, uh, take on the issue of how are we going to now uh, be in a position to neutralize and defeat the United States. Question. Yeah, a um, little different approach to countervailing measures and strategies. Uh, and maybe this falls under the ambit of the CIA and covert operations. But what does your research disclose in terms of our efforts to recruit the bank robbers? You talked about cyber threats. What are we doing to actively trying to engage the hacking community to gain from their expertise? Obviously, they figured out a myriad of ways of getting from point A to point B that perhaps the, the best and most well-educated hadn't figured out. What does your research show? Well, <clears throat> um, we have a number of people that work for the United States government in that category. But, um, and look, at everybody makes their pilgrimages to Black Hat, to RSA, to all these uh, uh, conventions, um, but that's not that's not going to be the solution. Now. We really need a strong foundation of technically competent individuals to not only offensively hack, but to do all the other things that need to be done on a protection side. And to tell you the truth, well, let me throw out uh, an idea that I'm trying to promote now as well. We need to get back into the game denial and deception operations as, as part of the best way to identify and defeat the enemy. We know that they're in our networks, okay, so let's give them something to eat. It's a, it's a sea change in looking from building walls, firewalls, and defense to an active defense in which we use traditional methods of counterintelligence in order to create a new you know, ecosystem to identify the advanced persistent threat on that. So, um, look, I, 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 will, I will tell you this, that the two greatest elements in hacking in the world are the United States and Russia. And Israel is close behind, but, and, and we cooperate, obviously, there's a lot of cooperation. Uh, and by the way, uh, it, it, I, I spent a lot of time with the Israelis who have left now those services and are setting up computer companies, software companies, in denial and deception operations. The biggest companies now in the world in that area are Israeli. Now, the question will always be, will they ever be able to sell to the United States government? And that goes, that's, that's a long discussion about why that there is, uh, the, the, there's resistance there. Uh, but um, let me tell you, there's a lot to be learned in that area, and we need, we need to, uh, to do better. But we need to train at a much earlier level in this country. One of the things I think it's, it's great is to get, uh, get kids involved. I worked with CyberWatch for years, and we run an annual cyber hacking competition at the college level, four men teams at John Hopkins APL. Let's get kids involved in early age in the game. And let me tell you, they get turned down big time. And then we have all, and then, then, then we have NSA and everyone there in the room at the end of it to recruit them. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our available time. I want to thank our speakers for what has not been a happy lunch hour, but which I think has been a very productive and a very worthwhile look at the kinds of problems that we face now and into the future. So thank you. Gentlemen, this is a